Welcome to Family Bible Time. We are in <clears throat> 2 Kings 13. And we're also in 2 Timothy 3. Two great chapters. That's what I was going to do. I was going to just check quickly to see if it is really just those two chapters. It, I know we listened to it last night, but can you remember? Was it just those two chapters? I think so. Yeah. You think so? Mm -hmm. And are you sure? Sure enough for me to carry on? <laughs> There's some domestic disputes going on. Uh, <laughs> My plans. Oh, sign in. That's not going to yeah, work. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, we'll go with that. If we get it wrong, we'll get, get it tomorrow. We just got back from church. We're a little too weary to I'm stop sure and start. Let's two. pray. Father, thank <laughs> you for your kindness to us, giving um, a long day of service to you. What a privilege, Lord. We thank you. Uh, thank you for the privilege of being worn out in your service. We know that um, there's many ways we could spend ourselves in this life, but to be spent for the sake of your people is the mm -hmm. highest privilege, Lord. You gave yourself for us. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the privilege of giving ourselves for each other. And to be poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice of other people's faith. We, we praise you for that and we ask you to please accept it and as a sacrifice of praise and please use our efforts. Bless the work of our hands, we pray. And forgive us, Lord, where we fail and sin so much as we go. Lord, please bless us now. Open our eyes and teach us. Lead us in the truth, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the 23rd year of Jerash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel in Samaria. You know what his brother was called, don't you? It was called, he was called Jehoahad. <laughs> but this one was the one who became king <coughs> because his name was Jehoahaz. I'm just joking, of course, dad jokes, excuse me, I'm tired. Okay. And he reigned <coughs> 17 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He did not depart from them, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them continually into the hand of Hazel, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazel. Then Jehoahaz sought the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, now the king of Syria oppressed them, uh, oppressed them. Therefore the Lord gave Israel a saviour, so that they escaped from the hand of the Syrians, and, from the, and the people of Israel lived in their homes as formerly. Now stop there for a second, mm. just before we go any further. How unbelievably merciful mm. is our God? Mm. Isn't it incredible? You say, well, the hand of God's judgment is being raised and we're getting closer and closer to the exile. Yeah, you're right. But even in the middle of this time of God's discipline, when God is giving them over continually into the hand of their enemies, when they sought the Lord, he restored them, he blessed them. Isn't that just so incredible? Mm. Don't, don't ever listen to the lies of the enemy when he would whisper into your ear, it's too late. Hmm. That's what the enemy would have you think, isn't it? You've hmm. sinned too much. There's no point going back to God now. What, what, is the, what is the devil saying when he says that kind of thing? He's basically saying God is not merciful. Hmm. And basically what this is saying is God is unbelievably merciful. So won't you believe that tonight and take it as an encouragement to repent 
And if you need any more encouragement, just there's a guy here who preached a sermon in Grace Life London today that you need to hear if you missed it <laughs> about the prodigal son. And, and really, uh, it's about the prodigious grace of the Father. And it's really incredible. But go listen to the sermon, you'll love it. It's a Puritan sermon from 21st century Sam. <laughs> um, we're calling you Sam Wise the Brave for preaching a sermon like that. You? <laughs> Nevertheless, they did not depart. Oh no, come on. They did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin, but walked in them. And the Asherah also remained in Samaria. You're like, oh. No, come on. So, hold on, the king sought the Lord, and the Lord had mercy on the nation, didn't he? And the people didn't, they still weren't changed. For there was not left to Jehoahaz an army of more than 50. Did I skip a verse? No, I didn't. More than 50 horsemen and 10 chariots and 10,000 footmen, which is a small army in those days. Mm -hmm. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust at the threshing. At threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jehoahaz slept with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria and Joash, his son, reigned in his place. In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, began to reign over Israel in Samaria. This just gets really confusing mm -hmm. at this point, because I think they all end up with the same name. But, um, and he reigned 16 years. He also did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. But he walked in them. Now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, and the might with which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam, hang on a minute, did Jeroboam come back from the dead? No, this is Jeroboam the second. Now you need to know about Jeroboam the second. Jeroboam the first was Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin with the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. Jeroboam the second is going to be a very important king to remember as we study this book, the Bible, because during his reign, some of the prophecies in the minor prophets were written, and there's some details of his reign to do with the, the prosperity of his reign and the defences that he built, which are going to come to significance as you read the other books. So take note, this is Jeroboam sat on his throne. That's Jeroboam the second. You could even write that in the margin of your Bible. And Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Now, when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, the king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. And don't you think he wanted, like, Give me a double blessing. <laughs> Can I have your cloak? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I think maybe he was lamenting the passing of the prophet. But there we go. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow. And he drew it. Maybe he didn't say it like that. Maybe he just said, Draw the bow. <laughs> um, it's a bit more dramatic if he said, Draw the bow. And Elisha laid his hands upon the king, king's hands, and he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot! And he shot. And he said, The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria. For you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. 
And he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you'd made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. So Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen. And the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. And ever afterwards, poor old Elisha just kept having people thrown into his grave in the hope that they'd come back to life. <laughs> I don't know. We, you can imagine what the Roman Catholic Church would have done with that if they had the tomb of Elisha. Anyway. Now Hazel, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them, and he turned toward them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, nor has he cast them from his presence until now. When Hazel, king of Syria, died, Ben-Hadad, his son, became king in his place. Then Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, took again from Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazel, the cities that he had taken from Jehoahaz, his father in war. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered the cities of Israel. So, for your quiz, <laughs> without looking at the page, tell me who was Joash, Jehoash, Jehoahaz, Jehoahad, Jehoahid, and... Any other Jehoahs that you can Jehoah think of? Was. Jehoah was. Okay. That's your quiz. And Ben Hadad and Ben Hadad a dad. Ben Hadad's dad. And <laughs> so on. All right. We'll, we'll pass on that quiz, shall we? This is complicated. Actually, it gets even more complicated if you want to try to link this up and reconcile it with the accounts of the same period of time in Chronicles, two Chronicles. Now, but it's possible to do so and really helpful. And we spent a while doing it when we went through the Bible chronologically. Sometimes you have to reconcile the reality that the names of these people are different in the two records. But you see that here. Sometimes one's called Joash and it's actually Jehoash and so on. And in another, in another book, it's called Jehoash, and you're like, who's this talking about? But you can actually work it out. There are no real discrepancies. Praise the Lord. Um, it does reconcile. It repays your investigation. But we only have that much sand. And we've got 2 Timothy 3 to read. So let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Well, you kind of knew that, didn't you? <laughs> times of difficulty in the last days. When, when are the last days, by the way? Okay, beginning with Jesus until Jesus comes again. So when, from Jesus' first coming to the second coming, these are the last days. And Paul is just reminding Timothy not to, not to misunderstand this. There's going to be times of difficulty. What's it going to be like? Verse 2, for people will be, can you see this? Lovers of self. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Oh, 3, sorry. I was a little bit confused. 2 Timothy chapter 3. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, 
ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Now stop there for a second. We'll come back to that. I know we haven't finished the verse, but what a list. Let's just think about a few of them. Um, Lovers of self is first on the list, isn't it? That basically describes our age, doesn't it? In fact, didn't Tina Turner sing a song about that? The greatest love of all? You, you weren't a Tina Turner fan in your youth? I, don't, I wouldn't be able when to When was your youth? Um, <laughs> Long... 90s. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Childhood. Forget, <laughs> forget how young this man is. Uh, yeah, so basically the greatest love of all is to love yourself. It was her song, I think. Anyway, um, this is crazy, isn't it? But this is actually what our age says is good. Hmm. And God says this is terrible hmm. to be in love with yourself. People say, finally, I've learned to love myself. Hmm. And as a pastor, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> And they're like, yay, victory. A victory over what? Guilt? Yeah, but it's not going to work, is it? Because you can't get away from your conscience. You know this is wrong. Lovers of money. Proud. Arrogant. Abusive. Disobedient to their parents. I mean, can I just say this, children? Please notice that this is in the middle of the list of terrible sins. Mm. This is unthinkable, but this is how it is, isn't it? This mm. is like being disobedient to your parents should be, in your mind, a terrible sin. It's not something that you can just say, "Ah, oh, I'm a teenager. That's what teenagers do. Or, oh, you know, everybody, all my friends at school do it that's just proof of what God is saying here. That's what it's going to be like in the last days because people forget God. So the fact that all your friends at school are disobedient to their parents is no reason for you to be. It's no reason for, it's no excuse for it. It doesn't make it less of a sin in God's eyes. God sees disobedience to parents as sinfulness, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, rather lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now this one, listen, listen to this. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. What does that mean? To have the appearance of godliness. That would be to be religious, right? To be, to be someone who's kind of got an outward show of religion. But what does it mean when it says denying its power? Who's denying the power of real religion? Well, they are. So the people who have a show of religion... Now think about this for a second. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Keep your eyes on me, no falling asleep. I know it's late and we're tired, but listen, I'm, I'm watching you as well. So stay with me. What does it mean to have an appearance of godliness? Okay, that means you're putting on a show, but you're denying the power. So you're denying that there's really power to change. And that's the reality, isn't it? So people go to church. They even say, I believe in Jesus. I'm following Jesus. Yeah, but do you know what? I'm just stuck with these sins. I can't get rid of these sins. I can't change. I'm just, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I'll always be an alcoholic. Well, hang on a minute. No, you won't. <laughs> because you can change. Because there is real power in 
the Bible in God. Yeah, I'm a homosexual. I'm just, I, that's my identity. I can't change that. That's, that's just who I am. Well, no, that's sin. That's sinful. But so, so you're saying, I am attracted to other people. I can't help that. Well, no, that's sinful, and, and God can change you. So actually to say, to deny the power of religion is denying the reality of God, isn't it? Saying, saying I, I can't change. It's impossible for me to change. Well, hold on a minute. 1 Corinthians 6. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul lists a whole load of sins, including homosexuality including slanderers and so on, and people doing all kinds of crazy sins. And he says, and such were some of you. Mm -hmm. Not such are some of you. These, these were their identities. They were their sins. Those sins did characterize them, but they don't anymore. That means there's possibility of change, of conversion, of transformation. And that's because, let, let, let's just get this straight, there is power in true religion. There is power of God available. But, let's come back to this text. There are some people who have the appearance of godliness but deny its power. And what does Paul say? What's the last words of verse 5? Avoid such people. Actually, he's not saying <coughs> avoid homosexuals and slanderers and all those people he lists in 1 Corinthians 6 to 9. 6. Um, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, he says, if you, I'm not saying don't have anything to do with people who are doing all those sins because otherwise you'd have to leave the world. Hmm. He's not saying as Christians we have to avoid homosexuals no, we love people who are lost in their sin and we reach out to them. But he's saying as Christians, avoid people like this who deny its power and avoid people especially who are characterized by these sins because you're just going to get burned by them. All right, verse 6. For among them, and this is talking about people like this who, who try to come into the church and refuse to change for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses so these men also oppose the truth men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, just read this last verse out loud with me, please. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Okay. I shouldn't come to the you, table with another translation. LSB'd it for us. <laughs> no, it's a good translation. It is a good translation. Now let's hear this for a second. 
Okay, this is a verse to hang your hat on, isn't it? Mm. This is a verse to memorize, to have just in you. Why? Because it tells you what you can believe about the Bible. Not just... Not just things... And it's very interesting. People often get hung up on all sorts of crazy teachings about, um, well, we, we don't have the original words that were spoken. Sometimes I've met people, and I remember meeting a man in the library at the Master's Seminary. He used to come into the library, and he had this pet theory about the original um, Gospels having been written in Aramaic and how he was trying to get back to the originals and he kept trying to persuade everyone about his crazy theories. And then maybe you've come across some of these crazy theories. Well, the word scripture here is helpful. All scripture. What, what's scripture? Scripture, it, 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 the word is the writings. So, we don't have the oral tradition. We don't have... So we've been hearing about the words of the prophet and what the prophet said. We, we don't have a recording. We don't have any other record of those original words than what we call and what the Jewish world always called the writings, the scripture. So these are the things that were written. Now get this for a second, because some people make to try to make a distinction between what was originally said and then what we have recorded, as if what was originally said came from God, but do you know what? It's been handed down and changed. No, all scripture, everything that is written was breathed out by God. So we have the scriptures. We have them. They're here. Okay, we have the original manuscript. We don't have the original manuscripts, but we've got the copies of them and and we've we've got the record of everything that was written. It's translated, yes, but we've got the original languages. We've got the we've got the scriptures. We can have in our hands a translation of the scriptures. And all scripture was breathed out by God. What does that mean? Well, it means, very obviously, that God spoke it in a way. You say, well, we're talking about writings. Yes, but it's like God made it happen. We use the word inspired. And that's where we, this is where we get it from. The fact that God just brought it into being. And because of that, you would say because of that, it's reliable, isn't it? Because of that, the Bible is not going to have error in it if God indeed breathed it out. In 2 Peter, in chapter 1, what Peter says that the prophets didn't say what they said, they didn't get, do what they did by their own imagination, but the people, men of God, spoke, men spoke from God, he says. And then he uses a very, very interesting word. He says, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And that word is interesting because it's like, the word that you would use of a ship with, with its sail out being carried along by the winds. So what's the picture? The picture is that the men of God, they gave their prophecies, and they wrote, they wrote in human words, didn't they? They wrote in their own language. They wrote in their own style. <coughs> but they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So... Our old pastor used to say it was like a company secretary um, and the boss wanted to give a message to everyone. But the boss came and said to her, do you know what, I want you to write the message. I'm going to give you the message, but I want you to put it in your own words. Now don't worry, um, 
you write what I'm saying, but you put it in your own words and I'll stand over you and I'll make sure that you don't make any mistakes. Mm -hmm. So that when, we, when we're done, it's your words, you've written it in your own language, everyone else understands, but I'm going to make sure that it's exactly what I want to say. I'll give you the message, you write it, I'll superintend the process. That's what's being talked about here. Yeah. God breathed out all of Scripture. Now, if that's true, well, then you can rely upon it. And what does it say? It's breathed out from God and profitable. That means beneficial. It's good for you. <coughs> What's it good for? For teaching. No, oh, here we go. Four things. For teaching. For reproof. That's knocking you down. For correction, that's bringing you back up again, setting you back on your feet. So one is correcting you, one is kind of reproving you, one is, one is, I suppose you would say, telling you where you're wrong. And the other one is correcting you, that's setting you straight, and that's like telling you how to do it right. So it's correction and it, it's, it's kind of reproof and correction. Let's think of it like that. And for training in righteousness. So, Scripture is useful for uh, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. The training in, involves, obviously, instruction, but also discipline. And Scripture is useful for all of that. Now, what's the consequence of all of that? That, verses 17, that the man of God... Well, you could say woman of God, because that just means the person of God here, may be competent. What does that mean? I can't hear you. Say it louder. What does competent mean? Anyone in the room? I'm still not hearing you. Come you on. Do it well. Competent means you, you, you're capable of doing it properly. If you say someone's a competent horse rider, means they can do it without making mistakes. It means you're, you're capable. And also equipped, that means you've got what it takes for every good work. So this is the Bible we're talking about. This is the Bible training you in righteousness, making you a, a capable. It's giving you the ability, but also giving you the tools that you need equipped so you've got all the equipment you need for every, every, it says, good work. So what more do you need? That's really good, isn't it? This book that we've been given is the scriptures. It's God's book, guys. So read it, dummy. <laughs> I mean, it's really not difficult, is it? I mean, it's like this book says that this book is the word of God. All of it. And it says that this is what you need. All of it. And it says that if you have all of it, you'll be trained and equipped and ready for everything. <laughs> what more do you need? You don't need a therapist. You've got to read the Bible. Well, maybe you need a therapist. Do you think they need a therapist? Someone told me today that I need a therapist, but that's... <laughs> They said I need electrotherapy, but that's another matter. Some people, if you believe this stuff, they'll say you're mad. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, Father in heaven, we just thank you and praise you for your um, kindness to us. Um, we praise you for your word. Praise you that you've given us everything. And... We ask you, Lord, that you would please equip us, train us, um, make us ready for everything, all the good works that you would have us do. Please give us the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit to help us to study your word, but also to help us to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, we pray that we would, we would be able to serve you with the result. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. All right, we are done. God bless you. That was family Bible time.
And I think it's like number 302, day 302 or three or something like that now. But we're getting through the year, aren't we? Just think of it, only 60 odd days till the new year. That's crazy. And then we'll be in the Murray McShane reading plan year two. If you stay with us, are you going to stay with us? Let us know in the comments. God bless you. See you tomorrow. <laughs>